in, the, in this last hour, what I wanted to do was kind of return to what we were doing this morning and engage a little bit more specifically in the process of scholarly teaching. Um, and so Bill set us up really nicely this morning. I wanted to talk a little bit, um, I'm, and I meant kind of said early in one of my comments earlier, I uh, personally focus much more when I, when I talk to folks on scholarly teaching versus scholarship of teaching because I think that when we start talking about scholarship, we start worrying about things like control groups and, and experimental design and things like that when what at least I'm most concerned about is helping folks help their students, right? And, and that does not necessarily require going full bore with the scholarship thing. But when I first heard the term scholarly teaching a few years ago and, and really had an understanding of what it meant, it, it really had a big impact on me and the way I think about my teaching. And it's partly because of the way we talk about teacher scholars at San Diego State, right? That we talk about teaching and scholarship um, as a, in a way that's supposed to be integrated, but we don't actually often truly integrate them um, in the way that, that scholarly teaching, I think, does and is able to accomplish. And so when someone was, when I was talking to somebody about this whole scholarly teaching model, the way it was presented to me was, well, think about the way you do your research, right? Think about the process you engage in as a researcher. You start with a research question, your goal, right? Um, and then you go through how are you going to answer that research question, and different disciplines have different methods and, and whatnot, but we all are, are searching for the answer to that question. And we also have standards within our disciplines about what it means to answer those questions adequately, right? And part of peer review is telling you if you've done that well or not. So if we think of these in these three steps, thinking about first, what is my goal, right? How am I going to achieve that goal? And how am I going to know if that goal has been achieved? We do that without thinking when we're, when we're engaging in research. But when we turn to teaching, we often are not this specific about it, or it isn't a conscious process. And yet, if we think about the teaching process, it really isn't that different. We start out thinking about what we want, in this case, our students to know, right? But what are our, our goals in terms of the classroom? What do we want our students to learn, to be able to do? What are we hoping will be the outcome of this educational experience? And as Bill pointed out, that doesn't necessarily have to be content or skills for the students, but it could be, I want my students to be engaged. I want my students to like my class and to like this subject that I am so passionate about. Right? Um, and then we think about, well, how am I going to do that? How am I, what pedagogy am I going to use? What activities? Am I going to lecture? Am I going to use hybrid course? What, how am I going to approach that as a teacher? And here is where the difference between research and teaching becomes I think really apparent. As researchers, we would never go off and try to answer our research question without asking what other people have done, right? We would never not consult the literature and see how have other people tried to address this or similar kinds of questions, and how am I adding to that? And yet, as teachers, we do it all the time. We say, I want to do this thing in my classroom, and we don't, we don't usually stop to think, has anybody else looked at whether this actually works? Right. Um, we don't look at the literature. Sometimes we don't even talk to other people. <laughs> um, but that is one type of evidence that we can think about using as teachers, right? the evidence that other people have collected. Then there's the evidence that we collect. Right? Finally, we, we go in, we teach, and we have these specific goals in mind. And usually, we have, at the end of the semester, some sense, conscious or not, about whether it's gone well. Right? We've all come back to our offices after a class that didn't go well, um, and maybe we stop to think about why specifically it didn't go well. Maybe not. Maybe we think, well, I'll tweak that next semester, um, that sort of thing. But the scholarly teaching process asks us to think about it very specifically. What happened? How do I know whether or not my students learned what I want them to learn? How do I know whether they're engaged or not? Um, what 
kind of evidence, what kind of information, what kind of feedback do I need in order to tell, right, to be able to evaluate whether they've learned what I want them to learn. And so part of what I wanted to do, what I was hoping to accomplish today was to give folks ideas about the type of evidence, the type of information that you could use. And as we saw in the previous session, there's lots of different forms of evidence. Right? And, and I use the term evidence. I economics is a very quantitative field where we work with, with data and numbers. And so I'm used to thinking about evidence and data as meaning numbers. But there's a lot of good qualitative information that we can get from our students. And in fact, I think oftentimes surveys are even more useful because they tell us why. They're, they're better at telling us why something is working or not working. Right? We can look at the outcomes in terms of how they did on our assessments or whether they passed the class. But if they don't do well, we may or may not know exactly why that happened, right? Was it that I didn't implement it well? Is it I didn't explain it well enough? Is it that I didn't give them enough time to process? Why did something not work? And that's what you can get at with surveys, right? That, that Katie was talking about the survey that they give and, and Edith to get at the why question and, and drill down into how the students are actually feeling about what you're asking them to do and why it works or it doesn't work. Um, Along similar lines, there are lots of ways to gather information from students that don't involve grades, assessing that information. So you could ask them to do one minute papers where you ask them at the end of class, what's the thing that's still the most confusing thing to you about what we talked about today? Or, or um, what questions do you still have? Or even getting you know, their uh, responses to non-graded clicker questions that are about the content, but how they answer those gives you a lot of information, right? That you, you may or may not give them credit for getting the answer correct. That's what makes it formative versus summative. Um, but that is information for you about where your students are at. Summative assessments are the things we think of as forming the grade for the class, right? The papers they write, the exams they, that you give. Um, <clears throat> You could also break this down further. I was really glad that Edith showed the rubric that she uses for her uh, digital project, because there were specific things on there that help you figure out not just whether the student deserves an A on the paper, but if, for example, all of your students are scoring really well on one piece of your rubric. They all actually got the content right, but the presentation is really sloppy. Right? And so you, you, if you've gotten that, those things as separate items on your rubric, then that's information about which specific outcomes are or are not being addressed, right? which skills. Um, and so I often think that even the, the things that you use to assess your papers or the way you, you grade your exams can give you additional information about how your students are doing. And then especially if we're talking about pedagogical um, th experiments that are affecting the whole course. If you're going to adopt team-based learning or problem-based learning or just-in-time teachings, and it's not necessarily just about um, student engagement in one section of the course, but the whole semester, then you would want to look at DF DFW, um, Bill showed the grade distribution earlier. D and F is explanatory. The W stands for withdrawal. This is something that the, the university administration uses a lot. High DFW classes are the ones where you've got lots of students um, either failing or, with, or they don't even stick around, right? They just they drop out. Um, <coughs> I would also add here that sometimes what we're interested in are the things that we don't see in our course but that are larger, and this is where the program assessment comes in. How many of the students in my class, for example, if I teach principals, how many become econ majors? How many actually do well in the follow-on core course? Those are the kinds of outcomes that we can't do alone, right? We can't figure out as, as individual instructors, but where conversations with our departments and our programs can become really useful. So this is just a kind of nice little menu of things that we could use as evidence. Um, 
And so what I wanted to ask you guys to do right now is to think very specifically about what your goals and outcomes uh, for, or hopes are and how that connects to evidence. And so this morning on page, what was it, 11 of the, <laughs> of the uh, handouts, you jotted down both, both nine where we, where we thought about sort of our individual plan for enhancing excellence and, number, and page 11 where we came up with sort of items that we could potentially investigate in a scholarly way, you should have jotted some things down. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is to think about what your specific teaching or learning goals are in terms of any changes or um, scholarly investigation you'd like to do. And this could be specific learning outcomes, and this is where if you brought the syllabus for a course, you might want to take a look at that and be thinking about where, where do my students need more help. Um, it could be at this level of rapport and engagement that um, I know is my top weakness um, in terms of connecting with our students. Um, but what are, try to be as specific as you can about what those learning or pedagogical goals are corresponding to, to sort of the actions that we talk, thought about this morning. So I'm going to ask you to take three minutes, three to five minutes to specifically write that down on this is part of what's on page 12. So um, page 12 and pages 12 and 13 in, in the handouts kind of walk through some of this. So the very first question about what is the purpose or goal of your study, I'm going to ask you to jot down some thoughts about your specific teaching and learning goals here. OK. So. I'm guessing folks have come up with their specific learning goals. Yeah, all the ITS folks are ignoring me. OK. <laughs> so what I want you get, what I'm going to ask you to do now, as my, as my voice gets louder, um, so you've got what your goal, you got what you're shooting for. Now I would like you to think about how are you going to know whether you've gotten there, right? That is, what would it look like if your students actually achieved what you're, what you're hoping for them to achieve? What does success look like? What kind of evidence could you collect um, to show that those goals are being achieved? Would it be a cert? Is it going to be based on a formative assessment, a summative assessment, surveys? What would that kind of look like? So, I'm, well, I'll just, just do that. So, take another five minutes. And this, again, is you could either do this on the back of that sheet or um, the, what is this, second, third, fourth one, fourth and fifth ones kind of ask you to, if you were going to conduct an experiment, sort of what would that outcome variable look like, that independent variable look like? OK. Lots of good conversation going on about what I've asked you to talk about, of course. So does anybody want to share some of the, what they've been conversing about? James? Sure. Wait, 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 wait. Here. Now that there's nobody here, okay. but they, st the, they still need it for the audience. Yeah, there are people here. Uh, we talked about uh, artifacts from students, work products. We talked about observational data of, you know, let's say, in a learning environment. That's what we were talking about. Is there more uh, rich collaboration where the students are interacting meet more meaningfully than they would maybe in another environment? Um, obviously, the gold standard is on those outcomes or on those work products. Was there a, a, a higher degree of, of uh, sophistication? Was it a, a, a more uh, well thought out solution to the problem that you've posed? So those were some of the things that we were, the, the main thing was the observations, because we are already gone into it thinking about obviously surveys, obviously, you know, artifacts from the students, and then we were thinking about, okay, well, if we were really observing to see how the interaction among the different, the students have changed, how the interaction between the instructor and the students has changed, that observational data would, would really help paint a, a better picture of what's happening. So 
So we have been talking about competency-based testing for our students that might occur at the end of a semester um, because it's not just what you learn in the class, it's your ability to demonstrate and perform that activity with a patient. So we can do that in our simulation lab uh, where we have uh, computer-driven patients uh, and we can set up stations where groups of students can come in and be tested over a period of time to see if they can in fact demonstrate what they learned in class applied to direct patient care. Anyone else want to share thoughts? You don't have to. Right, but I mean, we, we are trying to be building in benchmark testing because it's part of our accreditation. Um, it's not a requirement, but it will on you poorly if you don't do it. Uh, so we're going to be using Kaplan for benchmark testing at various points throughout the curriculum. But this is more uh, the faculty wanting to know that uh, in addition to being able to uh, understand the content and uh, respond to multiple choice test questions. Because we are a performance discipline, practice discipline, we want you to be able to show how would you, do, how would you apply that when you were interacting with the patient. Because that's where the rubber hits the road for us. And we'd rather not have you do it with a real patient for your, for your <laughs> first time out. Because you said that when you're in a discipline where you have a core concept in tutorial, that's great because there is a, something set up there and I'm really curious to see out what comes out of the data that Matt gathers. But you have to realize that these tests in the discipline just, you know, kind of test a little bit. Like a fourth concept in tutorial tests each yeah. student understand concepts. Now I went to that talk and he did, the student did very complex problems on the board. That's not at all tested in that, uh, in that test. So, you know, even if there are tests like observations of what can the student do on something like learning how they go, it's just a completely different measure that's in addition. So I don't think any discipline has everything already laid out. But it can also be a good place to start in the sense of like uh, using it as the pretest, for example, when students first come into uh, of your introductory courses to see sort of where they're starting from. Um, I mean, they could test, I mean, yeah. I don't think so, but it's just not, not, not that good. Other thoughts? Okay. Well, to be, to be fair, the, uh, the difficult concepts were edited down from hours of other footage, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to say, I, I actually was, uh, was challenged by this exercise at a more basic level than I think some of the discussion going on in that I am struggling a bit with differentiating between teaching goals and learning goals. So I don't think they're the same thing. I could have teaching goals to um, get my students engaged or have them enthusiastic or like my class. And I think the evidence that I might logically use to measure that would be indirect measures like surveys. On the other hand, learning outcomes are specific to the student. What I want, this, what skills and learning I want the students to acquire, whether it's dis something discipline-based or whether it's a broader skill like communication skills or critical thinking or something like that. And I think the evidence that you need to measure those is not indirect evidence like surveys, but it's direct measures of whether they have acquired those skills in that learning. Yeah, thank you. That's a, it's a really important point and, I, and one I, I was loosey-goosey with. So uh, that, that's a really important distinction because we do, especially if, um, you know, if, we, if we think about what um, the university asks us to do for assessment and, and those sorts of things that are very tied to the knowledge and content and skills that we want our students to walk away from. 
um, that kind of evidence is going to look very different than what we as instructors of a particular class want our students, you know, I literally in one of my classes tell the students that one of my goals is that they will walk out liking economics. <laughs> Um, these are future teachers of economics, so that's actually really important, but, but the only way I can assess it is, is with the survey, but that's not, that's not anywhere close to the kind of learning outcomes that we think of as objectives for content and skills. Yeah. They, could like it and not they could like it and not understand it at all, exactly. So, you can be engaged or enthusiastic or any of those things and still not that I think takes this to a higher level. Um, the university I was attending had what was called a provost ethics seminar. And once a month, a faculty member from each of the disciplines would meet with the provost and bring along a student. And one of the faculty members had to present an, on an ethical dilemma within their discipline but presented in such a way that everybody else around the room could understand. And the one that impressed me the most was it was a physics professor. And he mailed out an envelope with a three by five card and a series of paper clips. And the goal was that you had to open up the paper clips so it had two wings and count the number of times that you had to bend it back and forth before it broke. Okay, and then you had to write for your five paper clips, how many times, and then average. And as he walked into the room, he had a graduate student who collected that information, tabulated it. And then uh, as he talked, he you know, let everybody know how that came out. But his point was, his ethical dilemma was, as an engineer and a physicist, you are called to design an airplane that is flexible enough, durable enough, economical enough, light enough, safe enough to meet everybody's demands. So the ethical dilemma is where you cut corners and uh, how you cut corners in order to meet everybody's demands. And when does it become unethical to cut that particular corner? And then, once you've presented your discipline, People around the table are supposed to come up with ideas of how that might translate into their own discipline. It was one of the most stimulating things I think I've ever participated in in that community. Because then the faculty member and the student took that back to the class. And you learned new techniques of sharing that kind of information. And you had examples from other disciplines that you could then take back. It's just a fascinating thing to be part of. Maybe that really did. What does the paper clips have to do with it? Because, <laughs> because when the planes fly, the, the wings flex. Oh, so no, okay. Okay, so, so what you're getting At some point, you flex it too much and it breaks. People break. And whether it breaks over years or whether, I mean, I whether it's one severe storm, something will cause it to break. And it can break and be non consequential non-consequential, like the death of my car, or it can be it can break and kill hundreds of people. Other comments folks want to share? I, I wanted to kind of wrap this up um, <clears throat> Partly to show that I'm not a hypocrite and that I'm trying to walk the walk here as well and apply this process in some sense. I, I, I've done it, I apply the process, I think, in my, in my classroom teaching, but in my role as CTL director, I have a whole new set of goals and objectives to think about um, and corresponding evidence to collect. Um, so I thought I would share with you some of my goals for the CTL um, and how I'm trying to evaluate whether I'm meeting those goals. 
Um, I tried to phrase these as, as well-designed student learning outcomes um, with you know, action verbs and all of that. Um, and these obviously vary from event to event. But when I sat down to think about what do I hope to achieve at any CTL event writ large, um, I think that basically what I want falls into these kind of three categories. First, I want to, I hope that that event will provide participants with some food for thought, get people thinking um, about their teaching, maybe in a different way than they have before, but reflecting um, and thinking a little more deeply. But I also want them to walk out with something concrete. Um, and this goes to absolutely my own personal philosophy as a teacher uh, about what I want my students to get out of my classes. But I think it's really important to tie anything we do um, from a theory or hypothetical standpoint to reality, right? So what does this mean for what I can go and do day to day in my classrooms? And so I want um, folks to walk out of CTL events feeling that they have learned something useful that they can specifically do something with. Um, but ultimately, what I really want is to support and build a stronger community, community among the teachers on this campus um, so that anyone who wants to discuss their teaching at any time will always feel like they have peers that they can go to to have those discussions. Um, so that last one in particular <laughs> is really tricky to think about evaluating success, right? Um, and so this is where I'm cheating a little bit because part of the reason I'm sharing this with you is to get your feedback <laughs> and your ideas, right? So the evidence that we currently collect has to do with the numbers, right? Who attends, how many people attend, how many people repeat attend, um, things like that, how many people participate. And of course, we have the evaluations, which I really should have mentioned before half the room left but um, most of those of you who are still here know that we give out the blue evaluation sheets at every event. There's one in your folders um, that hopefully you will fill out. Um, you know, but but I, the other thing I've been trying to think about is, okay, so in addition to that data that we get from the evaluations and the data we have on how many people attend, what else um, would, what, what could I point to? What does success look like? with these objectives. One of the things that I, I'm hoping to start implementing a little more consistently is following up, finding out uh, what, you know, on the evaluations, people tell us if they think the information was useful, but whether they actually do anything with it remains an open question, right? So I will be doing more follow-up with folks, so you will be getting for those of you who have attended CTL events this year, you will be getting emails from me asking um, if you've done anything with that information um, and, and what that might look like. Um, and in particular, with the evaluations for today, you know, I'm at, the, the formative uh, or the, the feedback that we get on the evaluations and the comments is really the most useful thing, right? The numbers at the top are, are great. But again, it's the open-ended questions where you give me feedback about what worked and what didn't and what you, what you would like to see differently next time is the most useful part um, in, in figuring out how to go forward. So I will ask, you know, I, I, and again, I should have done this <laughs> earlier in the day, but to please fill out those blue evaluation forms. Um, if you have ideas about you know, the format, about the, the content from today, about ways that CTL can help you implement what we've talked about today. Um, if you have suggestions for other topics, I've already got a growing list of topics for next year that have come out of today's discussion. But if, you, if there are things that you would like to see CTL do more of, um, please give us that feedback as well. So other than that, um, I just wanted to wrap up by asking folks to take a few minutes to thank the speakers who are still here, Bill and Matt and Katie. Thank you everyone else. But thank you all for being here and for sticking out through the day. And there's food and drink out in the foyer, so please join us for that. <laughs>